Hello everyone, hope you're doing well. Today we are back looking at these suggestions past the developers for October of 2021 and now it's time to have a look at the aviation side of things. The first aircraft that is on offer is the Messerschmitt Me262 HG2 Schwalbe. Unfortunately this aircraft never got finished and it has no flight data on it. There is speculation that the vehicle got close to flying but it never did. We do know that the HG HG1 though did fly. Uh, if you don't understand or know what the HG series of the ME262s are, basically what they are is a further development of the standard ME262. The idea of the HG was to take all of the problems that the standard ME262 had and to try and make it better, to push on the evolution of the vehicle itself. And the first variant, which was the HG G1, or the V9 prototype as it was known, had a low mounted cockpit, also known as a racing cabin, which you can see on other vehicles, and also they extended the wing along the inner third of the wings with a 35 degree wing sweep, and also the fuselage was sanded smooth, and the HG1 did go under extensive wind tunnel testing and flew multiple times in test flights. It had improved acceleration compared to the standard ME262 that was used, but the plane still encountered control stiffening when it got to Mach 0.84. The HG2 is a slightly different uh, variant compared to the HG1. Basically, it still had the racing cabin and the smoothed skin, but it also incorporated a complete slept, uh, swept wing with a wing sweep of 35 degrees. The same wing sweep as the MiG-15 BIS and also the F-86 Sabre, uh, which was kind of interesting. They also uh, decided the surface area of the fuselage would be reduced by lowering the curvature of the body and also giving it a butterfly tail or a V-tail, which was also considered on the vehicle. I'm not sure if it actually ever got through with it though. Then you have the HG3. Uh, the HG3 is just a ridiculous machine, a complete redesign of the whole thing. You don't have to worry about the HG3. It's literally a wonder weapon um, when it comes to the German thought process, nearly on the level of some of Blom and Voss's thoughts. And uh, basically it's a 45 degree wing sweep, engine mounted very close close to the center line of the aircraft and also with the wing and the fuselage blending and it was virtually a new aircraft compared to the other 262s and also ridiculous uh, when it came to its general design. Now the HG2, uh, the reason why um, it hasn't been seen in game and why it won't ever be seen in game or it shouldn't I should say be ever seen in game is because the vehicle itself uh, was never fully finished. There is no actual uh, uh, record or data showing that the vehicle was fully finished. All we know is that it may have been near final assembly um, because uh, the actual conversion for the HG2 from the HG1 took a ton of time, basically near the end of 1944 into 1945. And uh, in general, uh, the vehicle was supposedly nearly ready for test flight, but then it had a runway accident, and then it had a bunch of other issues with it. And uh, therefore, it had some wind, wind tunnel testing on it, but never actually had completed construction, uh, construction parts on it. And don't even think about armaments or anything like that when it comes to the plane. So the HG-1 is kind of viable uh, when it comes to War Thunder. It's not a huge radical design compared to the standard ME262, but the HG2 itself, since it didn't fly, and since uh, we don't really know how far it went uh, when it came to the whole project, it's uh, kind of a radical uh, move compared to other stuff that we have, especially when it comes to Gaijin stances on some other vehicles when it comes to the game. We only have projected stats uh, for the vehicle, how fast it could go and all of this wonderful stuff. Technically, this thing could 
was projected by its engineers to be able to go to 0.93 Mach at 6,000 meters. Remember that a lot of projections never actually happen. Um, they get nowhere near them. And if you don't believe me, just go and have a look at early rockets and jet aircraft from the Soviets where they projected ridiculous numbers. And then even sometimes when they're fully built and tested, got half of those numbers. Uh, then uh, it had a flat turn speed of 28 to 30 seconds, um, which would be about the same as the ME262A1. The roll rate would have been okay and all of that good stuff. But generally, what you're looking at is a slightly improved uh, ME262 from the standard one, which, in my opinion, wouldn't fit really in the game since it is a paper plane. It was never finished and it was never flown, and that's the problem. We also have another failed Soviet aircraft. Uh, this vehicle was the Sukhoi Su-15-1P from 1949. And the best way I can describe this is it's kind of similar to the LA-200 that we have in game in general configuration with obviously some differences. So what it was, was a Soviet jet all weather interceptor designed by Sukhoi in 1949. The aircraft's project was under the name Samoliet P or Aircraft P and like the LA-200, it featured the unorthodox engine placement configuration of one engine in the tail and one engine under the fuselage. There was a total of two prototypes which we produced of this aircraft before the order on it was cancelled in favour of other aircraft. So another unfortunate failed design of the 1945 to the 1950 era for the Soviets. There was a ton of them, by the way, um, which is why we keep seeing them getting passed to the devs. Just vehicles which never lived up to the performance or just didn't fit the roles that were required. This being an all-weather interceptor would have been kind of interesting because it has access to a pretty crazy armament, very similar to the LA-200. It has three 37mm N37 cannons with 165 rounds overall. It also had two of the Tomansky RD-45F turbojet engines, um, which had developed 2,268 kgf of thrust each, would have had a really good rate of climb of 33 meters per second, and also uh, would have had a decent speed, being able to go up to around about 1,000 uh, kilometers an hour. There was uh, two technically built with one complete prototype and one incomplete, so therefore one built. And uh, generally for this vehicle, uh, what we're basically seeing from it is a very similar idea uh, from uh, or a very similar idea to the LA-200. Apart from this one, has a really cool nose on it, uh, which looks very funny. And then also at the same time uh, would be slightly different in characteristics, but not really. We have an offering from Japan, which is actually pretty cool. This is the Mitsubishi FST2 Kai. And uh, this was actually a prototype uh, aircraft which was derived from the T2 that we already have in game. It was also, uh, in essence, one of the prototypes for the Mitsubishi F1 as well, uh, which we also have in game. The FS in the designation stood for fighter support and was to skirt around designating the vehicle as an attack aircraft, obviously because of the um, things or the Japanese self-defense force, the idea is that they would not make any offensive uh, tools, uh, so this would be uh, slightly different from that. When it was designed, the T2 had always been envisioned to work as a basis for an aircraft design that could perform an anti-ship as well as close air support role against a potential invading adversary. And for this program, the second and third production T2s, the 59-5106 and the 5107, were selected for conversion into the FST2 Kai and received a variety of new equipment, including the JAWG-12 radar, the JASQ-1 fire control computer, and also the JASN-1 inertial navigation system, along with the JAWA-1 anti-ship missile control system and the JAPN44 radar altimeter, the JA24G3 air data computer, and also the JAPR3 radar warning receiver. So basically all the electronics you'd want for all of the different things. The new equipment required the removal of the rear ejection seat, which was replaced by the new electronics, and the electrical equipment was protected by a metal fairing 
mounted on the inside of the rear canopy. The aircraft was also developed alongside the DER and TER, a pair of ejector racks that allowed the aircraft to carry more than one bomb per pylon, and the outer underwing pylons received wiring to mount the fire infrared seekers to double the air-to-air -air missile payload as well in the need for emergency air interception when more capable aircraft were already tied up in operations. The new avionics set allowed the FS-2T2 Kai to perform precision strikes as it added CCIP and CCRP functionality to the aircraft, and the program to convert the upcoming uh, armed trainer to a fully-fledged combat aircraft began as early as June 1972, with only half a year after the first XT-2 being delivered, until 5106 took the sky for the first time on the 3rd of June 1975 and 5107 on the 7th of June. Both aircraft were then handed over to the Air Development and Test Wing in July, and over 200 flights were flown over the next year, and the aircraft would be accepted for a production configuration designated the F-1 on on the 12th of November 1976. So two FST-2 Kais continue to fly with the AT ADTW for decades to come testing uh, new weapon systems including the ASM-2 anti-ship missile and the GCS-1 guided bombs. The two FST-2 Kais were likely retired alongside the F-1 and the T-2 fleet in 2006, as uh, 5107 was still flying as of 2005 with the ADTW. So these planes were basically the basis of the F-1 and uh, therefore would fit pretty well in the tech tree, whether it's premium or whether it's other. The armament on these things, they had one 20mm Gem-61 cannon in the center with obviously the 750 50 rounds. They could carry 12 500 Mark 82 bombs or 5 750s or 10 500 infrared guided bombs and then also the Mighty Mouses and uh, the RL4 rockets. They could carry up to four AIM-9 aim nine uh, whatevers you know bz's p's or else sidewinder missiles they could carry four aam infrared missiles two asm anti-active radar anti-ship missiles and then two asm infrared anti-ship missiles so whatever you wanted this thing also had access to a chaff dispenser as well an ecm pod a radar warning receiver and also a radar which went up to 74 kilometers so overall it would have a lot of bells and whistles and would fit pretty well in the game. Then we have a plane for the Chinese of American origin. This is the Boeing Model 281. It was the export variant of the P-26 P shooter, which was used by the Chinese. Basically, it was the final version of the USAAF's first all-metal monoplane fighter, and largely similar to the preceding models, the P-26C differed only in small details of its engine and also fuel system, providing the Chinese Kuomintang much the same capabilities as their stateside counterparts. One of the most modern fighters in the world when first built, the P-Shooter was already becoming obsolete by the time the Rokaf uh, flew them against Japanese aircraft in the Second Sino-Japanese War, but still put up a good fight until the introduction of the A6M-0 outclassed it completely. Model 281s of the Rokaf were the first P-26s of any model to see combat, and their initial clashes with Japanese Navy A5Ms marked the first ever dogfights between all-metal monoplane fighters, securing their place in history. And although largely forgotten today, the Rokaf's Model 281s were the most modern fighters in their arsenal until the introduction of the Curtis Hawk 75s, and saw arguably the most successful and important combat missions of any P-26 model. Obviously, when it comes to War Thunder, this would be a very early vehicle for the Chinese, uh, with two 30 cals or one 30 cal and one 50 cal, depending on what you want to have a look at. It could also carry two 122-pound uh, bombs or five 30-pound bombs, and will be powered by the 600-horsepower Pratt & Whitney R134033 carburetted nine-cylinder air-cooled radial engine. 
Italy gets a World War II bomber, and uh, this machine is the SIAI Marchetti SM84. Uh, this vehicle was designed by the engineer Alessandro Marchetti to replace the S79 Spaviero. The Marchetti SM84 was a triple engine plane, and it was also used a lot in missions of Malta and also in anti ship, um, anti -ship campaigns against against the British fleet in the Mediterranean. It was inextricably linked to the glorious, um, the glorious squadrons such as the 36th Wing and also the 282nd Aero Torpedo Squadron, and it's an Italian bomber which was used extensively in the Second World War and gave itself obviously the three-engine layout which you know very well from the SM-79. The main objective of the project itself was improving the characteristics of the 79, giving it more powerful engines and also getting it a slightly better fuselage. It also had more spacious bomb bays uh, to be able to drop more and the bombs would be housed horizontally, unlike the previous uh, Marchetti models where they were stowed vertically. The, la the latter solution seriously affected the accuracy of the launch as the airflow due to the aircraft's motion hit the bombs out of the hold um, laterally meaning that it dispersed them over a large area. And uh, these vehicles are kind of cool because they use the Piaggio P11 engines, which had a thousand horsepower in each of the engines. It also had four uh, guns, 12.7 millimeter Isotta Fraschini Mod Scotty machine guns, one in a dorsal turret and one in a ventral position uh, to keep this thing alive. And also in two waist positions as well. So very similar to other vehicles that we have. It's Maximum speed was 487 kilometers an hour, and generally uh, that wouldn't obviously have been met with its cruise speed being around 346 kilometers an hour. And generally, um, it would be nice to see in the game. I'm sure it'll make it at some point um, because of its use. A weird and wonky French jet has also been passed. This is the CM-170 Magister, and this would be a jet which has a lot of weird things to it, and that's because it's not really um, something which was fully designed for combat, at least when it first uh, was around, this was more designed as a training aircraft. The Fuga Magister is a French fighter jet which was designed in the early 50s as a fighter aircraft, and with light offensive armament and an agile airframe, something that a lot of these trainer aircraft have. It should also be seen as more of a ground attack aircraft if it ever came to War Thunder, making use of its bombs and rockets complement while also being able to use its main armament. When it comes to the variants you have, you have the CM-171, the CM-172, the CM-176, which was a project, so we'll skip that one, and then the CM-171 Makalu. So the CM-171, or the CM-170R as it was known, was a vehicle which had access to two 7.5 millimeter guns in its internal setup and it had some pylons as well where it could carry two 50 kilo bombs and also some snare rockets if it wanted to even some AS-11s weirdly enough and then in its inboard pylons uh, it could carry two sets of T-10 120 millimeter rockets or 90 millimeter rockets uh, this thing also was powered by uh, two 400 kgf turbo mecha malbore 2a's so it could go a maximum speed of 715 kilometers an hour at high altitude but generally obviously it wouldn't get up there when it comes to the cm 172 which is known as the super magister uh, this vehicle had two 480 kgf turbo mecha malbore's uh, the the six variant of the engine, and it could go 780 kilometers an hour. It still had the two 7.5 millimeter guns, though, as its main armament. Also, 550 kilos of ordnance on two hard points, so it could either carry two 100 pound bombs, two 200s, two 500s, uh, or maybe even four HVAR rockets. Um, and in one source, it does it does talk about that it could carry two AS-11s, which would make sense if the first variant was able to as well then you got the cm171 makalu this one 
was given two 940 K KGF Turbomeca engines, the Gabizos, uh, which would be quite fun, but unfortunately, not a ton is known about this aircraft since it was an unarmed prototype. So this one wouldn't be very useful in the game. So basically what you're stuck with is a trainer with two 7.5 millimeter guns with access to a few bombs that goes at 780 kilometers an hour. Enjoy your 6.7 jet with two 7.5 millimeters. The Caproni B16A comes in, but not as something that you would actually think. Obviously, the Caproni was an Italian design, but today we're looking at it as in a Swedish uh, setup. Basically, in 1939, the Swedish Air Force had a problem, and due to the advent of World War II, export from the US had been cut off, and they couldn't purchase from either the present uh, tripartite uh, pact or the Allied powers. So, more specifically, the UK, which is something that they wanted to do. They didn't have the industry in Sweden itself to support any meaningful domestic production, so they needed to work out what to do here. They did consider getting Japanese aircraft and purchasing planes like the KR-27, but that uh, presented issues. And as such, they turned to Italy, and in 1940 they came to an agreement. For nearly 40 million Swedish kroner, they purchased 84 CA-313s, of which 30 would become B-16As. This was a part of what was called the Emergency Purchase, which also gained Sweden the J-11 and the J-20, and also Italian engines to use in their B-17Cs. They were all deployed to the newly formed F-7, which was based out of Setanas in, uh, in October of 1940, and were equipped with Swedish weaponry. Their service time was short, though, either due to sabotage, as the CA-313 fuselages used to construct these aircraft were meant to go to the French before hostilities broke out, but mostly due to poor maintenance and also pilot error. The aircraft actually earned the nickname the Flying Coffin. And during 1941, an Italian technician named Palla uh, Vicino moved to Sweden and rectified most of the issues by lengthening the exhaust ducts, revising the fuel ducts, installing fire guards, and also installing air intakes. This fixed the electrical and engine failures that I had before, but, which, um, but the poor reputation of the vehicle already left a poor mark on the aircraft, and either after or during this overhaul, all B-16As were converted to S-16As as the B-17 series entered production to take its place. Its torpedo brethren, the T-16B, was converted to the S-16B alongside it during the December of 1941. So these vehicles are kind of interesting, uh, basically an Italian design where they added uh, the Swedish weaponry to it, including two 8mm guns, um, when, or 13.2mm guns. It also had access to an internal bomb bay, which had a 400 kilo capacity, and also external bomb racks, which had a 500 kilo capacity, which they could have brought along. Also, two 8mm guns alongside the 13s uh, could also be present on the machine itself, and it used the Sota Fracini uh, Delta RC-35 piston engines, and uh, which gave it 12, uh, sorry, 1120 uh, kilowatts of power for the machine itself. It would be kind of interesting to see this thing, uh, since we already have a bunch of... Uh, we have a bunch of Italian vehicles in the Swedish tree anyway, and it could cruise at 445 kilometers an hour, or at least that was its maximum speed, I apologize, uh, which would be pretty impressive. And the last one is an Argentinian plane. This is the IA-58A Pucara and all of its variants as well. The, uh, the actual post talks about it coming to the British tech tree, because obviously the links that it has with the British tech tree, uh, which are uh, quite, um, I suppose, quite funny, um, but they, they really shouldn't be. <laughs> but generally, as a British person, it, it's kind of hard to look at this and, and not have a bit of a giggle. Uh, I'm sure this would annoy a lot of Argentinians, uh, but we'll go through it and I'll, I'll show you why. The FMA IA-58 
Pucara is an Argentinian uh, ground attack and counter insurgency aircraft which is manufactured by Fabrica Militar de Avions. It is a low wing twin turboprop all metal monoplane with retractable landing gear capable of operating from unprepared strips while, when operationally required. The type saw action during the Falklands War and also the Sri Lankan Civil War. And in August 1966, the Direction Nationale de Fabrication et Inter Investigation uh, Aeronautica, the Argentine State Aircraft Factory, began development of the AX-2, a counterinsurgency aircraft to meet a requirement of the Argentine Air Force. The project was promoted by engineer Ricardo Olmedo and became under the guidance of engineer Anibal Dredemi, uh, who, was who also designated the IA-52 Garani II and the IA-63 Pampa. The chosen layout was a low-wing monoplane powered by two turboprop engines mounted in wing-mounted nasals and fitted with a T-tail. In order to test the proposed layout, DN, DINFIA first built a full-scale, unpowered glider test vehicle, which flew for the first time on the 26th of December 1967. The testing of the glider showed no major handling problems, and in September of 1968, construction began on a powered prototype, given the designation FMA IA-58 Delphin, but later renamed Pukara. To be powered by a pair of 674-kilowatt Garrett TPE-331U303 engines. Uh, then, also the first prototype made its maiden flight on the 20th of August 1969, with a second prototype, uh, which um, also... Which, Sorry, the second prototype uh, switched engines uh, to some 978 horsepower turbo mecha as Tazu, uh, I think that is 27 Gs, um, following on the 6th of September 1970. The first prototype was later re-engined with the Astazus and this engine be being chosen for the production version as well and also a third production prototype followed in 1973. The first production model flew on the 8th of November 1974 with deliveries beginning in early 1976. And the reason why these things should go into the British tree? Well, after the surrender of the Argentine forces at the end of the Falklands War, 11 Pukara were captured by British forces, four of which were in flying condition, and six were sent back to the UK for testing and evaluation purposes. So, <laughs> that's why it should be in the British tree. Uh, this machine had a maximum speed of 500 kilometers an hour, so not very quick, uh, but it did have access to some pretty good ordnance. It carried two 20mm Spano Sousa HS 804s, four 7.62mm FN Browning machine guns, and also had three hard points which could carry uh, a thousand kilo bombs, uh, also the wing pylons 500 kilos with the total external store being 1,620 kilos. As always, I hope you have a wonderful day. And I'll see you next time. I'd just like to thank Professor X1718, Orange Tail, Sakoshi Tiger, BRFC15, Teddy, John Ryman, Universe A, Eugene's Terry, Ambrosius McClellan, Daniel Stanton, Martinez, B. Young, and then Carl Kinn, Barine, Lafouche, and also Samuel Slick for supporting the channel.